It seems there's really only one season per year in which I can just go nuts and overdose on anime. In 2016, it was summer. In 2017, it was fall. I mean, can you blame me? It's really hard to keep up with the incredible assortment of titles available each season, especially for those of us expected to maintain some semblance of a social life alongside a full-time job. <laughs> what? What's a social life? In any case, if you follow any other AnyTubers, you may be led to believe this season was rather forgettable, but to say it was a complete letdown is a vast oversimplification. Yes, there were more than a few annoying titles that were a chore to keep up with, but overall the selection was packed to the brim with surprises. So without further ado, let's take a look at the best and worst anime had to offer in the fall, starting with those I dropped. Ah, what can I say about Black Clover that hasn't been screamed from the rooftops by literally every single AnyTuber out there? Get it? Because Asta won't stop screaming? It's a generic shonen battle series that had a decent amount of hype prior to its premiere, then faded from the spotlight faster than Boruto did. I really hoped it would have more substance than it did, and I've heard it picks up steam about eight or nine weeks in, but after three episodes of... I, I couldn't keep going. If you've heard legends from the mythical realm of reality, you might know that there's a live-action series right now that's making waves among those I like to call Scottish weeaboos called Outlander. It's a story that involves a woman going back in time and falling in love with a man from that era, and it's apparently being called Scotland's answer to Game of Thrones. I bring this up in an anime roundup because Sengoku Nightblood involves a girl going back in time and probably falling in love with a variety of men from that era, all of which include pretty boy versions of historical warlords who also happen to be vampires or werewolves. It's a classic Otome setup, but considering my mom is heavily into Outlander, the only thing I could think while watching Sengoku Nightblood was how much the two have in common. If I had to give Suki Pro the animation any amount of praise, it'd be for its stellar mix of CG and 2D animation. It's a male idol anime, so in that tradition, it'll seem like it's set in a future where the female species was wiped out long ago, and now only pretty boys remain, but I really couldn't bring myself to watch more than three episodes. I blamed it on the fact that, at the time, I was already kind of invested in the Idol Master side M, and my limit seems to be one male idol series at a time, so Suki Pro the animation ended up on the chopping block. So, if those were the titles I dropped, I'm sure you're wondering what I thought of those I kept up with, and believe me when I say there are quite a lot more than in the summer. If you remember, I established a scoring system for these roundups. 1080p for the anime that blew my mind into pieces and left me unable to find many flaws. 720p for the titles that were worth the watch, but had more serious issues that I couldn't explain away and 360p for those that I finished, but just barely, whether due to glaring issues or just because I couldn't look away from the fire. I remember thinking at the beginning of the season that Inuyatsuki looked like it would be really freaking cool, and boy was it! It follows Ichiro Inuyashiki, a man down on his luck. His family could live with or without him, no one really cares what happens to him, and to add insult to injury, he's got about three months left to live. Just when you think Inuyashiki is about to enter the meth business, he gets killed in an alien explosion, forcing the extraterrestrials to put him back together as a cybernetic android. Inuyashiki resolves to use his newfound abilities to help his fellow man, but he soon finds out there's another like him who is using his powers to kill and torture people at random. It's then a frantic cat and mouse game as the elder who's decided to be a force for good and the teenager who's decided the opposite engage in a clash of wills. It's clear from the start that Inuyashiki is more a story of the duality of the human condition than anything else. If humanity were granted access to great power, the series dictates that one side would do as much good as possible while another would seek the path of chaos. 
It's not saying there's anything inherently wrong with humanity as it does this, however. It's merely saying that these are two very real sides of the coin. And regardless of how you feel about either at the end of the day, they're still human. I'm granting Inuyashiki a 1080p for being a wild ride that made me sad at times while also making me incredibly excited to see more of what is essentially geriatric Inspector Gadget. I can't recommend this series highly enough. I'm sure this might sound odd, but I fancy myself a connoisseur of anime where the cast is forced to kill each other off out of either necessity, sport, or a mix of the two. I'm not sure what it is about watching these people tear themselves apart, but it's something I keep going back to. Whether it's Danganronpa, Mirai Nikki, Magical Girl Raising Project, or Juni Tyson in this case. It might just be the guessing game of who will make it to the end that intrigues me, but oftentimes it's obvious who will be the victor based on who the story follows more than others. In Juni Tyson's Zodiac War, which was based on a light novel by the Monogatari series author Nisio Isin, the narrative faces this problem out by following a different member of the Zodiac in each episode. However, because they do this, it poses an alternative problem. With each episode following a different character, it becomes apparent who will be killed off. In some cases, the episode title even gives that information away. Juni Tyson's Zodiac War focuses on a societal battle royale that takes place every 12 years between 12 different people, all representing a different sign of the Zodiac, and if by the end of that explanation you thought the plot might have been written by an edgy middle schooler experimenting with their goth phase, I would understand that. I think the series could have done more to further its world building. As far as I'm aware, it's never made clear whether or not the Juni Tyson was a secret or if it was publicly known, though I'm leaning towards the former due to some things that occur in the finale. I'm giving Juni Tyson's Zodiac War a 720p for being a series I enjoyed keeping up with, but thanks to the scatterbrained pacing and how they fumbled the idea of following a different person every episode, it ended up just being decent where it could have been amazing. It's not common for a slice-of-life romantic comedy anime to feature a cast who aren't in middle or high school, so when you do find one, hold on to it for dear life. I said something along those lines when I discovered Golden Time, and I'll say it again before the video is done, because the same sentiment can be expressed in the case of Recovery of an MMO Junkie. Recovery of an MMO Junkie follows Moriko Morioka, a self-professed elite neat, which in her case simply means she willingly left her semi-decent career in exchange for a life of playing massively multiplayer online role-playing games. In starting a new game, Moriko decides to create a male character named Hayashi and meets a beautiful female character named Lily, who shows Moriko the ropes and becomes her most trusted confidant. When Moriko and a man named Yuta Sakurai have a rather violent collision on the sidewalk, Sakurai can't help but think of Moriko as he develops feelings for her, while she's reluctant to reciprocate because of her poor self-image and an unwillingness to leave her comfort zone. Recovery of an MMO Junkie is a hilarious and realistic take on romance in the internet age that takes things one step further by making the characters gamers in their late 20s and early 30s, which I'd be willing to suggest is a large chunk of video gamers today. It also helps that there were only 10 episodes plus an OVA and that the story is well paced and told in a way that keeps you hungry for more. I'll be the first to admit that I thought there would be an interesting point to be made about the overworking culture in Japan, but it never quite went where I thought it might. I still enjoyed it thoroughly despite that. I'm giving Recovery of an MMO Junkie a 1080p for landing the top spot on my top 10 of the season for like 6 or 7 consecutive weeks at least. I remember a time when I couldn't help but look forward to the next episode, and that's when you know you have a gem. If you remember, I made a video discussing why I believed King's Game the Animation didn't work as a series, if you haven't seen that yet, please do, and why I thought it was this season's Mayoiga. I'll admit, at the time of writing that video, I didn't think there was any way they could salvage the burning train wreck that was just begging to be put out of its misery, and really I was kind of right, but also not really, if that makes sense. I remember in the beginning of the season, I noted on Twitter, by the way, you should all follow me at pixelation underscore. 
that it seemed the popular thing to do among the big anti-tubers was to talk shit about the series and that I liked it. It was only a few weeks later that I saw how wrong I really was and wrote that video. So I'm sure by this point you're wondering just how my opinion changed after having completed the series, so I'll stop stalling and get to the point. It didn't change much. I still think it was poorly paced, the characters were stupid and did stupid things that shouldn't have been done, and the story relied too heavily on flashbacks and set up for the story they should have been focusing on. That said, I can't say I wouldn't watch if they actually decided to follow up on that threat of a second season. I'm giving King's Game the Animation the season's first 360p for being unbelievably annoying yet somehow convincing me to stick it out till the end and get some semblance of closure. I can't help but wonder if this series, like DS Ray, was made to be as bad as it was. It's not too often that I find an anime that's really, really bad, but I can't seem to take my eyes away from the screen. That was Dies Irae for me this season. In the beginning, it was actually one of the biggest surprises. The characters were interesting, the animation was solid, but then the story began to unfold and, well, to put it lightly, I sat through all 11 episodes and I still can't begin to tell you what it's about. There were multiple times I questioned if the writers even knew what was happening. In each episode, there'd be a new character or a new concept that we as the viewers were expected to be well versed on, but they didn't bother explaining any of it to us. Actually, I'm wrong. There was one time a character tried to explain how the powers in the series worked, but they ended up making it even more confusing, so the effort was wasted. I'm aware it's based on a visual novel, and I've been told it's a much better game than an anime, so maybe someday I'll get around to playing it. Until then, I'm giving DS Ray and its Nazi wet dream mythology a 360p. I'll admit, by the time I finished the season, I'd had enough. Oh boy! If you haven't seen my video on this series, you should go watch that and come back, because I'm pretty much just going to summarize my thoughts. I want to emphasize here, for the record, this series is not at all what you think. If I had a dollar for every person I imagine dropped this show in the first two minutes of the first episode, it wouldn't matter that I've lost the ability to monetize my content because I'd be rich. In any case, Emoto Sae Ireba E, or A Sister's All You Need, is, at first glance, a series that feeds the overwhelmingly powerful Emoto trend and is preceded by the literal dumpster fire that was Eromanga Sensei. However, when you actually watch the damned first episode, you'll find that it's not about that at all. It's a bait and switch. A Sister's All You Need follows Itsuki, a novelist who's made a name for himself writing light novels all of which generally involve a little sister being the main protagonist, or the main protagonist having a little sister. It should be said that he doesn't even have a little sister. No, he has a little brother. Joining Itsuki is the cute and perverted Nayuta Kani, the straight-laced college student Miyako Shirakawa, and the much more successful novelist Haruto Fua, all of whom love Itsuki despite his obsessions. In each episode, we sit in on a very real scenario in the life of a light novel author, including, but not limited to, playing board games, filing your taxes, going on vacation in order to effectively procrastinate on your deadlines, I mean, I mean research purposes, being imprisoned by your editor as a result of said procrastination, getting to see your novel turned into a crappy anime, falling in love with someone and realizing they don't love you back, falling in love with someone and realizing they do love you back, and playing more board games. I initially started this series on a lark. I knew how the series started based on the memes, but I figured I'd give it at least one episode. I mean, I gave Error Manga Sensei three episodes before I dropped it, so it's only fair, right? I then began to notice just how wrong literally everyone was about the series. I found that despite the fact that it is an itchy series, it's a well-handled edgy series. It's only in your face when it needs to be to either advance the story or develop one of the characters, and the fan service is intelligently implemented in an effort to separate this series from all of the countless others. I'm giving a Sisters All You Need a 1080p for keeping me hooked and making me laugh consistently throughout the 12-episode run, 
and for making me visibly squee in the final episode, but I can't say why due to spoilers. If you're looking for a, dare I say, wholesome ecchi series, you should definitely check this one out. In the meantime, I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope it gets a second season, because it could definitely use one. I was reluctant upon starting Konohana Kitan. I've never really been a huge fan of titles that rely on yokai or fox spirits. I dropped Fox Spirit Matchmaker after the first episode because it failed to make an impression on me, and the same can be said of the Morose Mononokian, though I gave that one two or three episodes. I'm not sure what it is I don't like about these kinds of shows, but it doesn't really matter because Konohana Kitan won me over with its pure heart. Konohana Kitan follows the whole crew at the otherworldly hot spring Konohanate, where spirits and deities alike come to unwind, but more specifically, the series focuses on Yuzu, a small and shy fox girl who begins work as the series begins. In each episode, we're shown a new aspect of Konohanate and the surrounding areas, including its relation to the real world, as well as the local shrine festivals and various eccentric patrons who visit the resort. If I were to say that Konohana Kitan isn't an overt piece of Yuri bait, I would be lying. But it's still one of the cutest pieces of Yuri bait to come out of Japan in recent memory, with the obvious exception of New Game. It's also worth mentioning that the series takes the term Moe Blob to a whole new level, as the characters often literally transform into Moe Blobs when they're flustered. I have to give Konohana Kitan props for taking a few of the episodes and actually blowing my mind with them. That's something I never thought I'd say about this kind of series, but here I am! I think I'm obligated to give Konohana Kitan a 1080p for providing a series about fox girls, deities, and spiritual themes that I could actually enjoy. It's adorable, heartwarming, hilarious, and can leave you a blubbering mess at the same time. I'd love to see a second season, but if not, I'd be fine. In either case, it's a series worth watching if you enjoy cute, colorful stories about girls that may or may not be into each other and the wackiness that transpires in their daily lives. I can't really begin to emphasize just how little I care about the events that transpired in Code Realize Guardian of Rebirth. It was a series I watched primarily out of some misplaced sense of obligation solely because I needed closure. I mean, the series itself wasn't bad. I didn't necessarily mind the concept, the animation wasn't bad, and the writing was tolerable. I think what I disliked most was that I could tell from the start that it was going to be one of those anime that crams too much content into 12 episodes, and, well, I wasn't wrong. Code Realize Guardian of Rebirth is set within an alternate London during the Industrial Revolution. It's a world that relies heavily on steam technology, airships are a common sight, and the fictional character Arsene Lupin is an active thief who's after a risky prize. It's not a physical treasure, however, no, it's a beautiful woman named Cardia. I'm certain you're picking up what this story is putting down. It's based on a Notsume game, so you're safe betting that the series has a bunch of male characters all pining for Cardia's affection, but none of them matter because it's clear who she'll choose from the start. I'm giving Code Realize Guardian of Rebirth a 360p for stuffing what should have probably been a 24 episode series into 12 and then expecting us to care about what's happening. It's harsh, but there's literally no other way for me to discuss this series without making it clear that I don't care about the significantly more attractive Queen Victoria and why she's fighting against the leader of a secret organization that looks and sounds like a girl but is actually a guy and y you know what, never mind, I'm done. Anime Gatteries is a series that honestly and truly surprised me because it takes a tried and true industry tradition, that of the school club anime, and turns it on its head. It follows Minoa Asagaya, who you could say the otaku life did not choose, who encounters Arisu Kamigusa, a rich, popular girl who is actually a closet otaku herself. Together, they attempt to start the anime club at their school and are joined by a chunibio named Kai, an idol fan named Nakano, a fan of light novels named Miko, and the mascot talking cat Niko-senpai. Each episode tackles a new topic of concern in the anime industry ranging from cosplay to production costs to conventions and expos. 
I'll admit, I was rather unconvinced by this series until they actually covered the three episode rule in episode three. It's that meta, folks. I'm giving Anime Gotteries a 720p for being a series that kept my interest till the end of the season, but kind of went off the rails in the final few episodes. I'm not saying the ending was all that bad, but it felt a little unfocused and I would have liked it to be better in the pacing department. I've gotta hand it to the creators of Urahara. They managed to make a series that nearly had me dropping it after episode 3, but I decided to give it more time and I'm glad I did. Urahara is a simple enough story. These girls are friends, who also run a fashion shop in Harajuku, but when an alien invasion traps them within the district, their friendship is put to the test as they band together to defend their home. It's got the most bubbly kawaii aesthetic, so I'd understand if anyone out there decides it's not their cup of tea, but it's in the latter half when Urahara really shines. It's always hinted that there's something dark and sinister going on behind the scenes, especially considering when an alien is defeated it transforms into sugary sweets that the girls then enthusiastically partake of. They're literally eating the remains of their enemies. However, I was very surprised to find that about halfway through, it reaches Evangelion or Madoka Magica levels of hopelessness and existential crises. It does eventually return to the familiar overdosage of kawaii culture and sunshine, but for a few episodes, things get really dark. I'm giving Urahara a 1080p for being the single most surprising series of the season, and for being a series that made me glad I didn't drop it when I thought I would. I really hope to see EMT Squared do more stuff like this because it worked really well. I find it amazing how, on occasion, a TV short can be just as good, if not better, than a full-length anime series. It doesn't happen all the time, but in the case of Love is Like a Cocktail, not only did it give us one of the best girls in Shisato, but it firmly established the demand for anime about adults drinking alcohol. If I had to summarize what this series is about without ruining it for everyone, it's basically about the cutest anime couple in the world. Chisato is a straight-laced office lady at first glance, but as soon as she drinks alcohol, she becomes a completely different person. Sora is a house husband who used to be a bartender and often makes drinks for Chisato to help her unwind after a long day. If you're looking for a series that you can speed through, each episode is only three minutes, so there's really no excuse not to watch this one. I'm giving Love is Like a Cocktail a 1080p for being a really cute, simple anime that stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the bigger series in the season. I would like to humbly request Creators Impact to announce a second season because I need more Yoidere in my life, and I think after seeing the series, you'll know exactly what I mean. It was right after I started King's Game, and I was still a fresh-faced, naive anime fan who hoped each series would be better than the last. I'll be honest, it would seem I misread the initial series description of Evil or Live, because I was under the impression it was yet another Killing Game anime, and it definitely isn't. It's difficult to say, however, what Evil or Live actually is. I do know one thing. It's not nearly as bad as King's Game, but it's also not very good either. Evil or Live is set within a bleak and dreary future where internet addiction has taken over the lives of countless young men and women, and as a result, the Elite Re-Education Academy is formed as a sort of rehab center. Hibiki is our main protagonist, a weak, anxious young man who's thrown into the facility and quickly finds things are not as they probably should be. He's approached by a mysterious figure calling himself Shin, who proposes Hibiki become his dog in exchange for his protection from the other students and faculty. I found myself really interested in the story for the first few episodes, but it ended up becoming one of those titles I regretted beginning just as quickly. It's produced by Howliners Animation League, a Chinese studio responsible for such titles as Fox Spirit Matchmaker, Blood of Wars, and A Centaur's Life, if that gives you any idea what we're dealing with here. I'm giving Evil or Live a 360p for seemingly giving up on providing any semblance of an interesting story about halfway through, and for ending the series unresolved. 
I can understand leaving some things for a second season, but only if the series is good enough to get one, which Evil or Live is definitely not. I could be wrong though, I've certainly been wrong before. As we near the ending of our journey through the fall season, I feel it only makes sense to discuss the reboot of Kino's journey. I say reboot because the version that aired during the fall is not the first time the community has been witness to the adventures of Kino and Hermes. I haven't been able to see the original series yet, but that's not important as we're talking about the most recent version, which was one of the more visually appealing titles this season. Kino's journey follows Kino, a young girl who's embarking on a journey from country to country on her talking motorad Hermes. I wish there was more I could tell you about the series, but since each episode is a different story with the only constants being Kino and Hermes, there is not much else to say. I think it's great the way it is, however. It's a low commitment series. Sure, it may be designed for you to watch from start to finish, but you don't have to. What's more, they ended it on an open note so they could make a return if they wanted, and I would be perfectly alright if they did. It's a visually appealing, thought-provoking, and overall interesting series, and I couldn't recommend it any higher than that. I'm giving Kino's Journey a 1080p for being one of the constants of this season. Each time I started a new episode, it was guaranteed to leave me satisfied, and that's the best thing an anime can do in the age of digestible 12-episode seasons, in my humble opinion. As I said, if it were to get a second season, I'd be more than happy to re-embark on the journey. But if not, then it's been a fun ride. It's time for the last entry in this roundup, and boy is it a doozy. I initially watched Yuki Yuna is a Hero a full year before the second season started airing, and I'll be honest, I didn't think the series would stick with me as much as it has. In this 12 episode second season, the first half is a prequel following the heroes that came before Yuki Yuna and her friends, and the second half is a sequel, picking up after the events of the original series. It may be an unpopular opinion, but after finishing this second season, I believe this series does the whole magical girls with consequences thing way better than Madoka Magica. I can't say much about the season without spoiling it, but I can say that if you were left wanting more after the original series, this time around we're given more information regarding the hero system, as well as whether the Shinju-sama is benevolent or malevolent. I was worried that since the first half of the season has more or less new characters that it would rush things along, but I was worried for nothing as the transition from Washio Sumi is a hero to Yuki Yuna is a hero is more or less seamless. I'm aware there are more novels in the series detailing what happened centuries prior, and if Studio Gokumi would like to adapt those, I'd be more than willing to partake, but if not, then I'll be perfectly happy with what we've got. I'm giving Yuki Yuna is a Hero Season 2 a 1080p for building on the framework of the original season, while also diving into the past to give us a well-rounded story of magical girls fighting for what they believe in. If you're a fan of Madoka Magica, I implore you to give Yuki Yuna a try. I think you'll really find something special. Whoa! That was a mouthful. But we've made it through the fall anime I kept up with. I'll be honest, I left some titles out for various reasons, but I may end up doing full reviews of those when I can get around to finishing them. In any case, it's time to give out the award for anime of the season, and it might not be a surprise that I'm giving it to a Sisters All You Need for being one of the only titles that comes to mind when I think of this award. It sent me through a whirlwind of emotions, made me relate with the characters more than once, and was the only title that actually made me squee in excitement during the finale. I cannot express how much I want Silver Link to bring this series back in 2018 or 2019. If you haven't seen it yet, please do! I really think you'll enjoy what the series has in store. Thanks for watching Anime Ambush! If you've made it this far, first of all, pat yourselves on the back because WHOA! I can't begin to express how thankful I am for your support. If you're interested in supporting this channel even further without paying a dime, may I invite you to subscribe if you haven't already? Or you can like this video and share with your friends who enjoy anime. Follow me on Twitter at Pixelation underscore for more anime-related posts, and until next time, this has been Pixelation, 
reminding you to stay pixelated.